Hello friends and welcome today. I wanted to talk a little bit in this lecture about how we go about the act of description as rhetorical critics. And I know I've talked a little bit about description before, but I think it bears discussing again after we've talked about the pentad. Because what the pentad gives us is a big list of different ways to see or analyze texts. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, I'm going to read you a short passage uh, from an article by a friend of mine, Dr. Alyssa Samick, who teaches out of California. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what description looks like, how thick description works, and we're going to discuss the subjective nature of description, how we as critics build a descriptive universe that we can then use as evidence for our interpretations. But to get started, I want to start with Dr. Alyssa Samick's article. You can find this article on our D2L page, um, but I want to read you a select portion of it as well. In this article, Dr. Samick is talking about the uh, women's suffrage movement and memory of that suffrage movement in 1977. So she's going from 1920, when white women, at least in the United States, gained suffrage, and moving forward to how that is remembered in the 1970s. Right? This is a year of the woman, International Women's Conference. There's a lot more in the 1970s going on as far as women's rights and women's equality than was going on in 1920. But at this conference, Dr. Samick is analyzing how this history is remembered. And so I want to draw your attention to one section where she has some just beautiful description. She's focusing on the conference program. Now that may seem like kind of a boring text, right? Like conference programs, it's, the, it's kind of uneventful. And she actually points that out when she talks about the, uh, the International Women's Year conference program. She starts her very first sentence is, the conference program, true to its function, is replete with relevant conference information, including event schedules, convention center maps, images of committee members and planners, and messages of welcome from the mayor of Houston and the speakers. Boring. But then she does more. She uses her critical perspective, a subjective perspective, right? She, as the critic, is at the center of her criticism, and she observes things from that place. She then uses her observation and describes what she sees in this program and how it's meaningful. Let me read this section to you. From cover to cover, the program deploys suffrage memory to undergird the claims articulated in the conference theme, American Women on the Move, by featuring the narrow narrative of the early feminist activist through story, image, and embodied movement. The front cover sets the tone for this theme of memory by featuring an image from 1914 during a suffrage parade on New York City's Fifth Avenue with an uncredited Miss Herbert Carpenter dressed in white marching from right to left across the page, holding aloft the American flag in the manner of an honor guard. The program cover reads, American Women on the Move. Visible at the top of the image, pairing the movement of the white suffrage in the 1910 with the movement of 1970. Along the bottom, the text reads, National Women's Conference, November 18th through 21st, 1977, Houston, Texas. The image in faded blue and white contrasts directly with the event and the date. A conference, not a march. 1977, not the 1910s. The cover collapses the time span between events, provides a direct link from one to the other, and centralizes white women dressed in white in the story of suffrage activism. I wouldn't have seen all of that if I was looking at that piece of, of memorabilia, looking at that piece of history. But Dr. Stamick brought her critical perspective and her questions and her understandings to something that could seem pretty boring and instead gives us a beautiful description. And you can see from that thick, rich description of the text, the scene, the elements of narrative and movement, the metaphor, all of those things she weaves together for some beautifully thick description in just one paragraph that then we could even see, even 
from our perspective outside of reading her criticism, how she might set this up and understand the meaning and narrative and story going on in this particular text. I'm going to share this article. Um, now obviously, this is written by a working professor and rhetorical critic, so it's not something um, that I would expect anyone to be able to write at their, their very first uh, time out uh, trying out their rhetorical criticism skills. But I'm going to post this on D2L so that you can get a look at some of this really thick description, and that's what we're going to practice in our next class together. I can't wait to see what kind of descriptions you all can come up with.